What a blessing. I'll tell you what, I am a blessed man. The reason I'm a blessed man is because of you, my family, and especially my God. When we were in Africa, it was astounding. We were so moved. God began to do things that uh, were just uh, transformational. And I'm going to have uh, Pastor Gabe and Minister Valentine come up, and they're going to minister to us. They're going to talk about what God has done. And I'm telling you what, church, uh, you want to see these uh, screenshots while they're ministering. These will be reviewed. We'll be going in a, uh, I can't remember what that loop, but uh, there's so much that uh, all three of us took photos of that we put it all together. And uh, Pastor Roman uh, put this whole thing together. And we're about to just take you on a journey in the three uh, uh, nations that we went to. And God moved in a way that uh, you'll never, ever uh, expect or see unless you're there and you experience it. But we're going to do the best we can to give you a shot of who we, we are as men, who God is as the ever-loving kind master God, and uh, there's just so much to see, and uh, this is where we come in to Malawi, and they begin to just rejoice of us entering. Amen. I want to welcome everyone here today. Uh, it, was just, uh, it was just amazing and stuff. It was, uh, we were excited. We uh, uh, first of all, I just want to thank God for allowing us to go, and I want to thank my wife uh, for the support that she gave me. Um, uh, she helped me get things together and stuff, and I just want to thank her, and, and I also want to thank Pastor and Josie for believing in us and stuff. Um, I had it in my heart for a long time to go, and uh, all of a sudden, you know, the opportunity was there, and you know, there's a lot of opportunity out there, and, uh, and uh, we both took it by the reins, and we just had a great time. Um, but to start off, we started on our uh, journey out there, and um, we ran into all kinds of problems, and you, a lot of you have probably already heard. Uh, we were on the flight, and uh, the aircraft, it was one of those big double-decker planes, and uh, the pilot comes out on the intercom, and he says that they're having problem with them uh, losing air pressure on the tires. And uh, so, you know, we kind of thought about it. It wasn't too alarming, but then when we had a land making a landing, it was just uh, um, you start thinking about it, and it was kind of afraid. But I believe between all three of us, we had just a peace about everything that was happening and all the problems that we had. Uh, just to try to get over there. Yeah, it was uh, it was quite the experience, and I'm kind of the opposite of Val. Oh, boy. He's uh, he's had it on his heart for a long time uh. to go. It was never on my heart to go. I never wanted to go. Um, I always stayed away from anything that had to do with leaving my country because I love my country. <laughs> and a couple years ago. At one of our conferences, they were speaking about missions. They were speaking about the things that God had been doing in other countries. And I kept ignoring God. I could, it was almost like I could feel him tapping on my shoulder. And I'm like, uh, I don't feel that. And I did not want to go. And I felt God finally, during one of the, the prayer services there, I felt him tell me that it was time to go. And I did not want to believe it. And I even said, well, God, if it's time to go, then you need to tell my wife too. And at that exact moment, my wife turned to me. We both had our heads bowed, and she turned to me, and she said, I think it's time. Amen. And I wanted to rebuke her. <laughs> so God called me about two years ago. And like I said, I've been ignoring it. I didn't want to go, and once God placed it on my heart, I didn't want to be like Jonah. Uh, so, some of you guys may know, some of you may not. Jonah 
was a man that was called to go preach the word of God to another place, to Nineveh. And Jonah, God called him, and Jonah did not want to go. Jonah didn't have a heart for those people, and he decided to go in the opposite direction of where God told him to go. And that's where God ended up having him be swallowed by a fish, and God took him over there and forced him to go. So I did not want to be swallowed by a fish, and so I decided I need to obey God. And so as, as Minister Val was saying, we were traveling over there, and I know he said that when he heard that there was issues with the plane, it was like, well, okay, I freaked out. <laughs> Internally, I was freaking out because I started thinking about how important the tires are to land on. And I started picturing the tires getting smaller and smaller, and then us landing on metal, and the plane ripping in half and me dying. <laughs> and so as we were going through that, uh, like he said, we, were, we flew from Denver to Minneapolis, and then from Minneapolis, we flew to Amsterdam. And that's about a 10-hour flight from Minneapolis to Amsterdam. Once we were in Amsterdam, we started flying to Nairobi, which is an eight-hour flight. And three hours into the flight to Nairobi is when the pilot came on and said, we're having issues with the plane, so we need to turn back around. So we turned around, and we thought we were all going to Amsterdam. Well, the tires began rapidly losing pressure, and so we had to make an emergency landing in Germany. And when we landed in Germany, we, we landed, and it was hot in Germany. And so we, we got there, we sat there, and it was about 30 minutes or so, and I was waiting to see when they were going to let us off the plane and, or if they were gonna, we were going to take off right away. And so as we were sitting there, uh, one of the guys asked the stewardess, he said, so are we getting off the plane? And she said, no, you guys can't get off the plane. And he goes, well, why not? And she said, because you don't have a visa for Germany. And we said, well, how long is this going to take to fix it? And they said, we don't know. So we ended up sitting on that plane on the tarmac with the plane off, no air conditioning for five hours. And people in America have really good hygiene, <laughs> but people from Amsterdam really don't. And it started to smell pretty bad. And it started to get extremely hot. And I used to be claustrophobic when I was a kid. And I started to get claustrophobic again. I felt like I was hiding under my bed during hide and go seek and I couldn't breathe. And so then we finally were able to take off. And so we all assumed that we were going to Nairobi, which was our destination. Well, we, he gets on and he says, well, we're gonna have to go back to Amsterdam because it's too many hours to fly to Nairobi. And so I'm thinking, oh, great, we got to do this thing all over again. And so we get there, we get to Amsterdam, it was what, maybe one o'clock in the morning? Yeah. And we get there and it was a mess. The airport was closed, I didn't even know airports closed. And the airport was closed and they're herding us into these lines and they're giving us vouchers for the hotels. And so we get these vouchers, and we ask the lady, well, where do we go to get to the hotel? And she says, well, just go out the door and, and turn right. And we're like, okay. So we go out the door, we turn right, and we walk the whole length of the airport. And we're like, uh, we don't see any shuttles, and we're lost. And so, and like I said, the airport's closed, there's nobody around. And we finally see some guards with machine guns. And I told Val, why don't you go talk to him, Val, and ask them where the shuttle is. <laughs> so Val walks up to him and tell him what they did, Val. Yeah, so I walked up to the guards and I told them, uh, I asked them where we needed to go and they got all aggressive with me. And uh, I was like, okay, we're gonna end up in trouble and stuff. And uh, so I, I was just trying to get some common directions and these people, you just be amazed. They just, uh, they don't care about the Americans. They don't care about anybody. And they just were just, uh, they told us, well, you guys got to go back the other way and stuff. And we're like, well, where do we go? You know, we couldn't even find the gate. And uh, 
So anyway, I started to talk to him and stuff, and then I started to get uh, a little bit, uh, um, I was annoyed by them, so I was like, well, you know, don't be talking to me like this. And then Gabe walked over, and he goes, come on, Val, let's just go over here. And it I was, was the funny. peacemaker. <laughs> and, and actually, this time, he was actually being calm, and I was like, these guys are just rude, you know? And we were just trying to get the direction, so anyway, we took off, and we had to go all the way across, and then we met, meet this lady where we first started, and she goes, yeah, you just got to go over here. They told everybody to go to the right. But when she was facing us, the right was this way. And so we went that way, and it was supposed to be the other way. And it was just a big confusion, and nobody, everybody you talked to, it was just, you know, that everybody was trying to push you off. And it was just a big uh, headache. But So then we go outside, and we're waiting, and we're like, okay, are we in the right spot? And all these, there's different people and we're waiting, and it starts to rain and everything, and we probably waited like an hour and a half and before this bus came, and then the bus finally came, picked us up, dropped us off, and uh, I don't even remember, it was late at night. We probably slept maybe two hours, got back up, went back to the airport, and then we had to wait at the airport again, and then we had to go on the journey for eight hours and stuff to Nairobi, and it was just like one thing after another, nothing went easy. But you know, uh, between me and Pastor and Gabe, we all had a, we talked about everything that went on and, and we had a peace about it. And uh, you know, I think it was just the enemy was trying to keep us from uh, uh, going and he was trying to get us to get all mad and everything, but, but we didn't let the, uh, him take advantage of that. And uh, we just thank God that he uh, got us there safely and that wasn't the end. You know, we had a couple other incidents on the plane. Um, and I'll let Gabe talk about that. But, uh, you know, the, the main thing, you know, when we got to Malawi, it was just a blessing. We finally got over there. And uh, the pastor, uh, uh, David Kafaro, he picked us up. And, you know, he's just talking to everybody in the airport. And he's passing out these flyers. And they're like, uh, it's the million dollar, uh, a million dollars. And he gives them... And it's actually a track, and the, and the guy, one of the guards, uh, guards got really, he got really ticked off and stuff. And he goes, this ain't a million dollars, and he threw it down. And he goes, oh, yeah, it is. It's a guarantee. And the guy was getting really aggressive, and me and Gabe were looking at each other and pastor, and we're like, oh, no, this ain't going to go good. But then he began to tell him about Jesus and how Jesus can bless him, and, and it was a, a true blessing. And the guards, you know, they, he, uh, Pastor David, he knows everybody there. And if he doesn't know him, you know, he passes a track and he just begins to tell him about the Lord. And um, him being a pastor and, uh, you know, any one of us could do that. You know, we have a lot of people here in town that are lost. And, uh, uh, but it all it takes is for us to open our mouth. But uh, as we got to Malawi, it was a blessing. And uh, everybody was waiting outside and they greeted us and, um, it, it was just, it was just unreal. It was like the whole time in my life, I, uh, I thought about it. And, um, like I said, I always wanted to go and, and it was just like, it was like a dream come true for me. And the Lord just showed me that he can do anything if we just allow him. Yeah. <clears throat> go ahead, brother. So as Valentine was saying, throughout the travel to get there, um, it was a, a nightmare. Um, we had thing after thing happen to us. Every single flight that we had, there was an issue with the flight. And um, But what was good is that every time we would have a five-hour stop-off or a two-hour layover or our issues, what we would do is we would sit together and we would talk about the things of God. And that's what carried us through. And in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, it says... And we'll read through 1 through 5. It says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into his grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope for the glory of the Lord. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit 
who was given to us. You see, church, so as I was thinking about just the heartache that it took for us to get there, I was thinking about how difficult it was and the, the trials that we went through. I began to realize that what God was doing is he was preparing us. He was preparing our hearts. He was preparing um, us physically. Because once we landed in, in Malawi, it was nonstop all the way up until we got back home. But what happens is, is sometimes in life, we're going through trials, we're going through struggles, we're going through hardships, and we don't realize that it's something that is preparing us for the future. It's preparing us for what we're about to do, that God is going to do through us. So if you're going through an issue in your life, if you're going through a struggle, I encourage you, look at it as something that is producing perseverance. And what I believe is that God was burning off all of the stuff that was us going through that. So then when we got there, we got there with a grateful heart. We got there not with with the arrogance that we normally walk in compared to what they walk in, but we got there in humility and humbleness. And sometimes if you're going through struggles, God may be telling you you need to humble yourself. And so if you are going through trials, I encourage you guys Focus on God. And that's why I say when, when we were going through that, instead of sitting there and complaining about what we're going through and saying this is ridiculous and, and I want to go back, we focused on God. And that's what produced the perseverance to get through this. And so we ended up landing in, in Malawi. This is Malawi. That's me. I was preaching, and Daniel next to me is our um, interpreter. And this is some of the youth um, that were dancing, and then this is some of the women's group. And just the way they sang and the way that they worshipped was incredible. Roman, can you start it back into um, Malawi? <coughs> so like Val said, as soon as we pulled up into Malawi, um, they were there greeting us, singing songs. And it was something that was such a great honor. Um, and this is part of the structure that David had built. That's um, Pastor David. They call him Abusa David. So that's something, Chechua. They, and in order to say pastor, they say Abusa. And so this is part of their congregation. And so we were able to go into this area. And when we got there, we weren't sure what to expect. And... This is where they were receiving the gifts that you guys all had given. So I want to start off with first talking about when we first got there. Um, we get there, and, and it's a huge celebration. And they're just celebrating us. And like I said, it was so humbling and that they were so grateful. I, we look at ourselves as we're nobody. Um, we're not anybody important. But they looked at us as, we sacrifice so much just to get to them. And that's what they would tell us over and over again is, is we just thank you so much for coming all the way from America just to speak to us. And their hearts were so receptive. So as we were there and, and we began to minister, uh, so uh, my dad was able to minister myself and Valentine, and Valentine was able to speak to the youth and I was able to speak to the youth as well. And it's funny because you guys all know in the Word of God, it says to be ready in season and out of season. And we learned what that meaning meant. Uh, because so when we get there, originally my dad told me to have two sermons ready. He said, because you're going to preach once in, in Malawi and you're going to preach in Uganda. And I was like, okay, cool. So I have two sermons ready, and then come to find out, we're going to preach a lot more than that. And so we were there, uh, we greeted all the people, and we get to go and minister, and one of the guys, his name is Mata, he's one of Pastor David's guys, um, he's one of the ones that runs the, the part of the church and the orphanage and everything, and he comes to me in Val, and he says, hey, do you guys want to come with me to the youth? And we were like, yeah, sure. So we go over there, 
And while we're walking, I ask Mata, I say, so what are we doing? What's the plan? And he goes, I don't know. It's up to you. And I was like, what do you mean it's up to me? He goes, oh, you're going to teach the youth right now. And I was like, oh, no. And so me and Val are walking, and it's about a five-minute walk. And so I'm, I'm over here trying to put it on Val. I'm like, well, Val, you could do this time. And he's like, no, you said, he said you were going to do it. And I'm like, okay. So we're walking, and we get in there, and the youth greet us with songs also. And so they're sitting there singing, and I didn't want to be rude and looking through my Bible where they're singing. So I sat there, and I listened to their songs, and they sing so beautifully. And so as they're singing, I'm praying, and I'm like, God, just play something on my heart because I don't want to let these kids down. And they're done with their songs, and he's like, okay, well, Umbusa Gabriel, go ahead and speak. And so I go, Val, uh, why don't you open it and tell them about yourself? And so Val stands up, and, and he's talking and just thanking them. And the whole time, I'm flipping through my Bible. And as I'm flipping through, um, I open it to, to Acts. And it's in Acts chapter 16. And it's about Paul and Silas. And so what God had showed me as he placed on my heart is that everywhere we went in Malawi, they were, it was all about worship. It was all about praising God. I, was, I figured out that you can sit there and you can just read them scriptures for your sermon and they would love it. They would eat it up. They don't have to be entertained. They just want to hear God's word. But their thing is worship. And so God showed that to me. He placed it on my heart. And as I began to speak to the youth, God took me into that, those section of scriptures. And Paul and Silas, they get arrested. And they're arrested, and they're sitting there in jail, and they began to worship. They began to praise God. And all the people that are in the jail, they begin to listen, and they begin to hear that they're speaking about God. They begin to hear that, that they're worshiping God. And they're looking at them like, these guys are sitting in prison, but they're worshiping. And as they begin to do that, the chains begin to fall off. The doors start to open in the prison. And they end up getting released from prison. And what God was showing me is that the people of Malawi, they, were so, they have such a loving heart for God in their worship that God will continue to have the chains fall off of them. And, and it's like that for us in our lives. I was telling them that what I figured out was that I believe that worship was a secret weapon. And um, in times of need, in times of struggle, when I feel like I can't have a breakthrough and I feel like my prayers are hitting the ceiling, that it, you worship and God will have breakthrough. And I want to encourage you guys if you feel like God's not hearing your prayers, if you feel like um, you, you can't get into your word, if you feel like your mind is blocked, I encourage you to worship because that is such a breakthrough. And what I told the people of Malawi is that they've unlocked the secret. And we haven't unlocked that secret here in America. We don't have that heart of worship like we should. And so I encourage you guys, start to seek out how important worship is. And as you go through and you begin to, to study the Word of God, you can see breakthrough in worship. Like King David, he sought after God with worship. And like Paul and Silas, how they were released from prison through worship. So I encourage you guys, unlock that secret. And um, Val, do you want to talk about what, how it was with the youth for you? Yeah. Uh, so, like, when Gabe was saying, uh, I kind of just thought of it, like, when, uh, you know, we got to be ready in season and out of season, and um, I, I had, like, four sermons done, like, a month ahead of time, and I was just studying every day, and I was like, okay, the Lord was kind of leading me, I'd pray, and, and uh, so when we got there, you know, I had, like, four sermons that I could choose from, and it's kind of funny how Gabe said that he didn't have anything, but the Lord still placed something on his heart. And uh, so when Gabe spoke the first time, we were in a room 
probably half the size of this, and there was probably about 50 youths, 50 to 60 youths. And then the next day we came back to that same room, and they go, oh, no, we're not going to do it here. And then I'm like, oh, okay, well, where are we going? So then we went to the auditorium, and it it's probably seats like 1,000 people. And there was probably, just in the youth, there was probably about uh, 75 youth. So after we sang and we danced and we just, we just uh, me and Dave was get, uh, Gabe getting into the dancing and it was just, you know, we, were, we weren't dancing for ourselves, but we were dancing for the Lord and it was just, it was just amazing and stuff and uh, these kids are just so excited and they're so hungry and, um, and it was just such a blessing. So I began to, I went up there on the top and I started looking out and I was like, okay, there's like 70 kids out there and stuff, and I started to get a little bit nervous. But then I had a calming spirit on me because I realized that it wasn't about being nervous, but it was about just giving God's word. And, um, and I began to minister to them about, you know, we're not to compare one another and that we're just to love one another. And, you know, because sometimes, a lot of times, even as adults, we kind of compare each other, oh, okay, well, he's doing that. Well, I'm going to do this. And it's not even about that, but it's about just uh, being in unity and doing for God. And we're not competing against each other, but we're, we're here to uplift one another. And when your brother is down, your sister is down, what God is calling us to do is just lift them up. Give them a good word. And uh, uh, the Lord just began to open that as, as I begin to read my sermon out and stuff and there was things, and I noticed in the past when I start to, to study, sometimes I have a hard time on a certain area, but I follow through and I, uh, uh, I follow through with it. But a lot of times when I'm actually ministering to people, that the, I just, some, for some reason, that's not even important. The Lord just gives me words to speak, and I just, like, pass that area up. And... Um, you know, we may not think that we're making a difference in people's lives, but when you have people come up to you later and stuff and they just say, wow, that was really powerful or that really meant a lot, then it's just a blessing, you know, and uh, um, it's not about us. And I get nervous and I, 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 uh, the Lord comes on me, I cry, and it's a joyful cry. And, and it's, just, uh, it's just amazing, but, you know, we can't be afraid to open our mouth and uh, uh, because... You know, we all have loved ones that are hurting and lost or um, that are in drugs and um, family members that are caught up in drugs. And, you know, we just got to open our mouth and not be afraid. And uh, that's something that God showed me that uh, just open your mouth. Uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, I write things down, and but it's really coming from the heart. And that's what God is calling us to do is just to open our mouth and to share the love that he has placed in us. So we can spread it out and people can get excited and, and on fire for the Lord. And, and that's what it took place. It was a blessing. And uh, me and Gabe, I think we, we never acted like, like we did. We were dancing up a storm. Pastor was out there dancing even. And, and it was just a blast and it was a blessing. And um, if you have an opportunity, you know, they have uh, conferences every year. And Pastor uh, David and Martha, you know, they say, They'll welcome people. They can uh, uh, house up to 12 people. So if you have an opportunity um, later or something, you know, it could be arranged through pastor, and, and you can go out there. And there's just so much more that uh, we've experienced. And these slideshows is just a small portion of that. And if anybody wants to talk to us at any time, you know, we'll be willing to share what God has done for us and what he showed us. And, and the people, it, it was amazing in Malawi to... Um, one thing that really touched my heart is we had our Bibles or a coat, and these people would just flock to you, and they want to carry your Bible, and they want to, uh, they take it to the church, and I'm like, oh, well, what are they doing? And they just grab it from you, and they begin to carry it, and they follow us to the church, and they place it down. They don't let you carry anything, and that's, that's, uh, that showed me that they just wanted to be servants for the Lord. Amen. Amen. Yeah, it, it was incredible. And before we jump into Uganda, um, so over there in Malawi, the work is just so incredible. Uh, they have thousands of chickens, and they sell chickens, they sell eggs, they have uh, crops where they sell tea, they sell maize, and, and that's something that David, 
he helps so many people. Around. So they have a compound, or it's a huge compound with a wall built around it. And what he does, because a lot of times people are hostile to, um, to white people. But what David has done and God placed in his heart is when he built that compound, everybody outside of the compound, he helps them. So there's a lady that's a widow that didn't have much. She, didn't, she really didn't have anything except for a house to live in. And he went to her and he told her, well, how can I help you? And she said, well, it would be great if I can have some land for crops. And he bought her land. And he would put um, fertilizer so that he can make the ground fertile. And, and that's what he would do is all the people around him is he would, he would bless them and he would tell them that it was the blessings of God. And, and David is such a, he's such a trip. Everywhere he goes, it, it, he, he's only focused on how Jesus can save him. That's his whole focus. He goes to a store, he's focusing on how can I save somebody. And it's funny because when we la- landed into Malawi, uh, we had to kind of go on our own separate things in order to show them our passports. And the guard, he, he asked me, he goes, so where are you going? And I said, well, Malawi. And he goes, no, where are you staying? And I was like, Malawi. <laughs> and he goes, no, what's the address of where you're going? And I'm like, uh, I start panicking. I'm like, I don't know the address. And he's like, you don't know where you're staying? And I start freaking out. And then I hear somebody say, arrest him. He shouldn't be here. And I'm like, and it's David. And David's passing out tracks to everybody. He's distracting everyone. And the guard is like, just go ahead and go. But that's how Christ works through him, is he is just so bold. And I thought I was going to jail. And then I hear him say, just arrest him. We don't want him here. But that's how it was. In in Malawi, it was such a joy to be there. The people were so loving. And they were so receptive. So after we were in Malawi, I think we were there for uh, five days or something like that. Uh, we end up flying to, um, I believe it was Kenya. And while we were flying, we ended up having another issue with our flight. And we ended up meeting a couple of guys. And one of them ends up being a pastor from Kenya. And he's a really young kid. But he said that God just placed it on his heart to be a pastor. And so we were able to minister to him. We were able to minister to another kid that, um, that he goes to school in Kenya, but he lives in Malawi. And now he wants to go volunteer at David's orphanage. And so God was just continuing to move. And I believe it was because we had receptive hearts, because we didn't have negativity. So as we fly and we land into Kenya... Uh, My dad had told us, well, you guys will get a day to kind of rest and relax. And we're like, okay, cool. So we land, and we we traveled all night. And Pastor Coney picks us up. You guys all know Coney Orozco. Uh, He speaks at a lot of our conferences. Well, he picks us up, and he's like, are you guys ready? And we're like, yeah, no, we're ready. He goes, okay, great, because you're going to take a shower, and then we're leaving. And we're like, we're leaving? He goes, yeah, we have an eight-hour drive. And we're like, no way. So we get there, we take showers, we jump in this truck. And we jump in his truck, we start driving. And we start driving and driving and driving to where we go through this mountain, kind of off to where he lives. And then we start to go in, and we're going through the desert. And we just keep going. And I'm like, how long is this going to take? And so, and we have a caravan. There's some guys that are following us, um, a bunch of Coney's guys, and we just keep driving. So I'm thinking, okay, well, we're going to be staying in the desert, and it's going to be hot and miserable. And we keep driving. We drive all the way through the desert, and we end up taking a turn on a dirt road. So I'm thinking, okay, we're on this dirt road, so we're probably 10 minutes away. So we were driving about two hours till we got to that dirt road. We turn on, and about two hours into the dirt road, even Coney is like, how far is this? And I was like, haven't you been there? And he's like, no, I haven't been there. 
And I was like, well, who has been here that's in this car? And none of us had been there. And I said, well, are they going to be receptive of us? He was like, yeah, I think so. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, what are we getting into? And just before that, I read an article about Al-Shabaab, a Muslim terrorist group that were killing Christians in Kenya. And I'm like trying to look up where that map was or where they were. But by the time we are in two hours into the dirt road, I start to look around and I notice that there's no more power lines. And I'm like, there's definitely not internet here. And there's not going to be any power. And so we're driving probably about four hours into the dirt road. And we come and there's this huge village. And like I said, there's no electricity. People are very primitive. It's exactly how you would think Africa would look. And so I'm thinking, all right, we're here. And even Pastor Coney and my dad are like, this is it, you know, God's going to move. And so we're driving and we drive through the village and we're like, well, I guess we're probably staying in a hut outside the village. Okay. And so we're driving, we, we cross through this river that had been dried up and we pull off and we ask Pastor Frank, he's one of Coney's guys, we tell him, so where are we staying? Somewhere around here? And he goes, no, we still got a couple hours to go. And we're like, are you kidding me? And then we start to go up a mountain. And going up this mountain, it was a four-wheel drive um, road. It was crazy. It was like being on the wild chipmunk, any of you guys that have been to Lakeside, <laughs> where we were getting slammed left and right. And it was just a crazy drive. So we're driving up this mountain. And it's two hours into driving up this mountain. And we finally get to a spot where the, the dirt road that we were following ended. And we're like, all right, cool. And the guys are like, no, we got to keep going. And we're like, but there's no road. Where are we going to go? And so we have to maneuver through trees around, and we just keep going higher and higher into it. <clears throat> and then finally, we get to the top of this mountain. And what was crazy was when we started driving from Coney's, we saw these huge mountains off in the distance. And we were like, man, those mountains are humongous. Come to find out, the end of our destination was on the top of one of those mountains. And when we get there, there is about 30 people standing there. And they're singing songs. They're clapping. They're jumping up and down. They're just uh, so excited. And I'm thinking, how did they know we were going to be here at this time? Like, they must have had it timed perfectly. And so I asked, we had interpreters with us. I asked one of the interpreters, I was like, so they knew we were going to be here at this time? He goes, no, they've been standing here since this morning. He said, they knew you were going to arrive today, but they didn't know when. And they would have stood here all night until you got here. And I remember thinking, just what an honor. See, they looked at it as, it was such an honor for us to go to speak to them. But I looked at it as what an honor that they would stand there for hours and hours and wait for us. And it showed me the heart of Christ. It showed me that He will stand and He will wait for you for hours, days, weeks, months, years until you decide to fully serve Him. And I, I felt it was such an overwhelming feeling to see these men, women, children just celebrating the fact that we had arrived. And it made me think of heaven and how the celebration is when you arrive and our loved ones when they arrive. And it was such an overwhelming feeling. And as we get there and, and they're hugging us and they're just loving us and, and they're just so excited and they're trying to talk to us, and we don't know what they're saying. And we're just like, yes, praise God. You know, I, I point to everything every time I'm talking so they can understand. But it was so overwhelming. And Val, if you want to talk about when we got there. Amen. So when we, when, like Gabe said, when we finally got there, and, uh, um, and we, well, as we were going up the mountain, it wasn't even a road. It, it was a road for a while, but then it began just to be a little trail, and we're like, well, where, you know, because we didn't know where it was going and stuff, and 
Um, when we finally reached the top and everybody greeted us, we got out, we hugged the people, and, you know, they were just bowing down to us like, oh, thank you. Like, you know, they were talking in their language, and, but they kept bowing down and stuff, and all we could do is, is hug the people and love them. And uh, so then we got back in the vehicle, and we still had a little ways to go. So we, we kinda, they kind of just moved out of the way, and we got to the top. And um, it was just so beautiful up there. I, I mean, Colorado Mountains, you know, they're beautiful. But once we got up there, to me, it felt like heaven. It was like, man, look at these mountains. And there was all kinds of trees going all kinds of ways as you look through the pictures. And um, it was just a blessing. And we kind of all looked at each other and we're like, oh, we finally made it here, you know. And with all the difficulty, it was just worth it. And you can just tell that... Uh, these people, they were just so hungry for the Lord that uh, um, they were there waiting for us. And, and we hadn't even started to minister to them yet. And, and uh, they were just so accepting. You know, they were just so happy that we were there. And uh, the Lord began to show me, you know, this is, this is what it takes, you know. And, uh, you know, I, I know sometimes, like here in Colorado and stuff, there's people hurting a lot right here too. But we don't, not that we never do, but. We need to go out, and we need to speak to them. And um, as we start to go, uh, we got to the place where we were staying, and me and Gabe thought, we're like, okay, well, where are we going to stay? And we thought we were going to just sleep on the ground somewhere. And one of the pastors had a home there, and uh, it looked like he just took all whatever he had out. And because uh, when we got up there, we took like five cots up there, just the mattresses. And uh, so we all had beds, and we were pretty surprised about that. And um, and then we found out that the pastor was in the back room, and he was sleeping on a hard cement surface. And then I was like, oh, gee, you know, how humbling, you know, that he was just happy that we were there and uh, that we were going to have revival. And um, it was just amazing. But they were just so giving, you know, beyond our measure, what we can even think about. And... Uh, so we get there, and, um, you know, we unpacked, and every, all, all our stuff that we had, everybody was grabbing it, and in the house that we stood in, there was probably about 20 people, and it wasn't a very big house, and, uh, and uh, we had the shower and an outhouse, and, uh, you know, we, we uh, get so accustomed to what we have here, and uh, like Brother Tony was telling me, oh, yeah, you're going to shower in a, in a little tub, and and I'm thinking, what? what are you talking about and stuff? And literally, we did. It was just probably as big as I am and, and probably about five, six inches of water and stuff. And you look at this, and you look around. There's cow webs everywhere, and you're like, how am I going to do this? But they heat water for you and stuff, and um, you just make the best of it, you know. And, and I begin to appreciate every single thing that we have here in the States, you know. Uh, simple our showers, water, drinking water. They, um, we didn't drink none of the water that they had because they say you could get really sick. And, uh, but it was just a blessing to see that these people were so acceptive. There was really, they were really young, young pastors. And uh, one brother that was there, uh, you might have seen him in the picture, uh, Brother Richard. He came out of the streets and um, he was. Uh, uh, he was caught up in a lot of stuff, and but he didn't have anything. And uh, one of the things, I kind of get in a little head, but one thing that uh, he told me that he goes out and he ministers to the youth. And uh, and we're talking like about 100, 150 people in the streets. And that's his ministry and stuff. And um, while we were there in the conference, we were just walking, and I was taking a bunch of pictures. And this old lady, she was on the ground, and she stood up, and she just started to shake our hand, and she, she told Richard in her language that when he was living on the streets that uh, she gave him porridge and a piece of bread, and he couldn't remember her at first, and then all of a sudden, he looked at her, and he grabbed her hand, and he just started crying like a baby, and he was just saying, thank you for feeding me, because he told me he hadn't eaten in three days, and it was just like, whoa, it was just amazing, you know, but... The, the personal testimonies that we had was just so touching and so life-changing, you know. And, and uh, <clears throat> what the Lord was showing me with all that was uh, 
you know that he's done so much in our lives, and we take for granted what, what he's done, you know. <clears throat> me personally, he's delivered me from drugs and um, just so much stuff, evilness, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I, like, like witchcraft and evil things, you know, because I had such a hardened heart. And um, I take for granted, and, and I try not to, and, and I keep giving it to him, and I try not to take for granted, but, you know, it was just an eye-opener to get out there and, and uh, to see what we've seen and, and be able to minister to the people because, you know, God surely showed us that he has delivered us, but we keep going back into it, you know, and me personally, I go back into things, and I try not to, you know, and 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 but the main thing, like I was telling my daughter last night, we were talking and I said, you know, we're going to fall. We're all going to fall. We all mess up. But you just got to keep asking God for forgiveness and you got to go forward. And and that was one message that I spoke up there. You know, quit looking back. You know, we, too many times we fall short because we keep looking back and God delivered us and he wants us to go forward. And too many times we go backwards and we're like, oh, why am I going to do this again? And the, what God showed me is we need to go forward, forget about the past, and know that he delivered us, but go forward. And, and he just wants to show us new roads, new avenues, and he just wants to bless us, you know. And, and I think that's some, a word I have for everybody. You know, we're all going to fall and we're going to stumble, but we need to just ask for forgiveness and move forward. Yes, amen. And so as we get there and we begin to minister uh, we go, and there's a, a small little church that this guy had built on his property. And we get there, and we start ministering, and there's about 20 people there. And, and I'm thinking, wow, you know, that's a lot of people for such a small village. And so we're ministering, and as we begin to, to minister, more people start showing up. And then after the morning service, then the afternoon service, the whole building is completely packed where you could barely even walk in it. And I'm thinking, man, this is a lot of people. And as we're ministering, my dad, you guys know how he speaks into people, and God shows him things. And it, was, it blew my mind. There was one guy, because I, I can see, you know, we know people in America, we, we kind of have an idea how their problems are. But out there, we don't know these people. And my dad called one of the guys up, and he says, why don't you stand up and... The guy was like, he stood up and he had a translator and he said, I can see that you used to steal goats and you used to steal animals and that you, that's how you survived and that you were a great thief. And he was just speaking to him about how God wants to move in his life. And I'm watching the guys around him and the guys around him are like, their jaws are on the floor. And um, I think it was my dad or Coney asked them. They said, what, what, what's going on with these guys? Why are they all in awe? And they said, because he used to steal everybody's animals. And they said, how does he know that? And it was the power of God. And so as my dad was speaking and he was ministering, he called another guy up. And he says, he, he starts speaking to this guy. And the guy is looking at him like, just with a stare. And my dad is trying to talk to him, and, and the translator is trying to talk to him. And my dad asked him, he goes, what's wrong with him? And they said he was born deaf, and he can't speak. And so my dad was like, oh, he goes, you know what, I want to pray for him. So he pulled the guy up to the front. My dad calls us around him, and we began to pray for him, began to lay hands on him. And my dad begins to pray that God will reconstruct his ear and that he will begin to be able to hear. And as my dad is praying, the guy kind of starts to flinch a little bit. And I was like, whoa, what's going on? This guy has a demon in him or something. And he starts flinching. And one of the guys next to him starts snapping. And the guy starts going like that. And he begins to be able to hear. And the whole crowd erupted. And my dad was saying, he said, this isn't me. This is God. This is the power of God. And this man began to try to say words. And they tried to get him to say words. By the next day, he came into where we were staying. And he was able to say his name. 
he was able to say Pastor Coney's name. And God just began to move. After that, we could no longer have our services inside that little room. That's him right there. So this is him. The next day, I began to watch him, and I took a video of him. This is during worship. Is, and I told Val, I said, look, he can hear the music. And he was dancing to the music. He was worshiping. He picked up that chair and was dancing with that chair. And after that, we couldn't fit in the building anymore. We ended up having to have the services outside. And by the second night, there was over 500 people outside. And one of the ladies said that she had walked from 6 in the morning. Because we were asking them why their night service was at 9 o'clock at night. And I was like, that is so late. Why is it so late? And they said, because people start walking at 6 in the morning just to get there by 9 o'clock at night. And there was 500 people. By the last night, there was over 800 people that were there. And God just began to break loose. They were so receptive. He began to break polygamy because they are polygamists. He began to break that. He began to break curses off of them. He began to just move like I've never seen before. People were, uh, we would walk by people and they would fall out in the spirit. And God was just, it was uh, incredible. I've never seen anything like it before. And it, it blew my mind. And it, it just really spoke to me how when you're receptive and you have a heart of belief, that God can make the deaf hear. It's not just in Scripture. He can do that here. Amen. Amen. Yeah, we don't have that much more time. We got so much to say, but uh, one thing is that, that I know that, uh, uh, you know, God move in the, the power and the authority that God, he's put that within us, but we just got to step out. And before we went there, pastor's going to say, You're, you'll see, you'll see what I'm talking about. And I couldn't capture it and stuff, but when we were there, um, this one lady, one of the pastors, Frank, he said that uh, she was really heavy. She's like in her 70s, heavy into witchcraft. And uh, so before the service started, I seen this lady by the river, and she was washing her clothes, and then she put the clothes that she washed over her other clothes. And this lady came up, and uh, as we talked to Pastor Frank, uh, he said that was the lady that was had the witchcraft, and uh, me and Gabe and Pastor uh, prayed for her, and you know, and she got she fell out and stuff, and we just began to pray for her for deliverance, and she got back up, and we prayed for her again, and the Lord, the Holy Spirit, just took her down and stuff, and um, it was just like oh, you know, it was just amazing that God could use us, and that we took a chance to go out there, and He used us, and we prayed for people like Gabe said, and. That never happened to me before, you know. The first lady I prayed for, she fell forward, and we hit each other's head. And I was like, oh, wow. And, and then uh, the next day, uh, Pastor said, just keep moving in the authority that God has given us and the power. And the next day, I prayed for people and gave me and Pastor. And people were, like he said, just six, seven people. We, we just touched one person, and they just fell out. And it wasn't us, but it was God's power. And um uh, it was just amazing to be there, and uh, Pastor's going to continue on what uh, he has to say because we're running out of time. But I uh, want to thank everybody for uh, listening to what we had to say, and, and if you need to know any more, we'll be happy to share with you. Well, I don't care about time, so I'm going to keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, like he said, it was incredible, and I've never seen God move like that before, and it was because they were so receptive. So as we were there and we were ministering and we were praying, God began to show us that this doesn't just have to happen in Africa, that it can happen anywhere. As long as we are willing to do it and as long as the people are willing to receive it. And so as we were there and as we were ministering, there was another guy that his leg was like six inches shorter than the other leg. And he had polio. And we began to pray for him, and his leg began to extend out to where it was almost even with the other leg. And we believe that God is going to completely heal him. 
And so as we were going and we were ministering, God just moved. And what was crazy is a lot of the guys that were with us from Coney, it, like Val said, they call them street boys. So there's, there's uh, people that they call street boys. So they're all kids that live on the streets of Kenya. Uh, they're homeless. They, they have to fend for food. They steal or whatever they have to in order to get food. And all of these guys that were with us were all street boys. They were all people that Pastor Coney had ministered to, brought them into the orphanage, and rose them up. Now most of those guys have a wife and kids. They have property. They have homes that they had built. And to see God move through those young people, because God was moving through them as well. And it made me think of our youth and how we can rise up these young people to move in the power of God. That us as adults, a lot of times we tie our hands, we tie God to where because we're not willing to do it, God is just waiting for us to be willing. And if we rise up our youth and show them that they can be used it's something that for our next generations. So in there in Uganda, when we were praying for those people, um, they're, they're at war with another village. And they've been at war for we don't even know how long. Pastor Coney asked one of the guys there. He had to have been in his 80s. He said, do you know how long that you've been at war? And he said, I just know that since I've been alive, since my grandpa's been alive, and since his grandpa's been alive, generation after generation after generation has been at war with these with this other tribe and coney he began to ask him well what are you guys at war for and it's because somebody had stole a goat and somebody had stolen a cow and they had gone back and forth stealing from each other and they ended up killing each other and he said everybody raise your hand who had lost a loved one over this war and all the people that were there, every single one of them had raised their hand. And Coney told him, is it worth it? And they've been at war for probably a thousand years. And they, and they began to say, it's not worth it. So he said, if you guys want peace with this other village, with this other tribe, I want you to stand up. And nobody stood up. And he's like, so you're telling me that it's worth it to die over a goat? And he says, if you guys want peace, I want you to stand up. And nobody would stand up. And Coney is like, he looks at it, he's like, I can't believe this. These people don't want peace. And the interpreter is, is translating everything as he's talking. And finally, Coney says, if you want peace, I need you to stand and one of the leaders stood up and he said, I want peace. I no longer want war. And then they all started to stand up. And what, what we were doing and what God was doing is he was breaking that curse of war. And they began to say, we want peace with those people. And so now Coney is going to try to figure out how to talk to the other tribe and, see, and tell them that they want peace with the Pocote people. And we're hoping that we can go into that other village and do the same thing that God did over there at this new place. And so God just began, he was breaking generations. What blew my mind was that these people have had their culture since the beginning of time, and they were willing to drop it like that. They were willing to forget about polygamy. They were willing to drop the war that they were in. They were willing to forget about all the things in their culture for the gospel. Amen. And I think sometimes we forget how powerful the gospel of Christ is. That if you speak the gospel to people, that they will begin to be set free. You don't have to have this magical prayer. You don't have to have special words to say. You don't have to know a, a secret potion or a formula you just preach the gospel and the love of Christ, and God will begin to break through. He'll begin to break chains. And so God just went crazy for those people. And so as we were leaving, we began to head back. And when we headed back, we were able to go into uh, Pastor Coney's orphanage. 
And we were able to, to speak to them and speak to the people at his church. And we were able to go and treat these kids. So there's all these kids and people that have, they call them jiggers. So as they're walking, they're, they don't have shoes. So they're walking through dirt, through um, animal feces, through everything. And they begin to get these worms embedded in their feet. But their feet have such, so much callus on them that they don't feel it. So they're walking everywhere and they have worms in their feet. And the worms eat away at their flesh. And they have ringworm all over their head. And so part of the medical mission that we went to is that we had to treat them for ringworm. And me and Valentine picked that part because the other part to get the jiggers out. So we met another team out there and some of them were doctors. And what they do is they have to dip their feet in kerosene. And when they dip their feet in kerosene, then they sit them down and they have to cut their feet open and pull these worms out of their feet. And then they have all these calluses that are just growing on their feet and they had to scrape them off with razors. And it's children that are like that. It's um, men and women. There was one, it was an older gentleman that he had to get that removed. And it was like an inch that they had to scrape off of his feet. And then they began to put little slits in his foot and began to pull the worms out of his feet. And this guy was so grateful. And all these people were so grateful. And they just wanted prayer. They just wanted a touch from God. And so as me and Val were doing the ringworm, they would, they would go and they, they would go in a truck. And they would go to all the villages around. And they'd pick up all these kids. And then they would come and bring all the kids to us. And then wave after wave of kids would come out of that truck. And I'm thinking, I can't believe all these parents let this guy take all their kids. Because I think like my wife, where it's like just some man went and picked up all these kids. But that's how hungry and desperate they are for help. Is Pastor Frank told him, I'm, I'm here to help you. And I can help your kids if you let me take them to these Americans that can help. And so they began to um, bring all these kids and we were able to treat them clean their feet, and God just began to move. And what is such an awesome work that Pastor Coney does is before, when they would do this, they would get six to 800 people that would come and they would have to treat them. They would be there for 10 to 12 hours. And now they get maybe 50 to 60 people, maybe 100 people. And that's how they do this all the time. So now the jiggers are starting to no longer take place inside these people's bodies. And it's just such an awesome work. And it was so powerful and able, that we were able to be used by God. And I thank all of you guys for your prayers. Uh, I was telling Brother Joseph, that because he said, we were praying for you. I could feel your guys' prayers. Because it was nonstop while we were there. It was morning, day, and night. We would sleep for two or three hours at night, and then we'd be back up studying. Uh, like I said earlier, my dad told me to have two messages. I ended up preaching seven times. But that's how God was moving. And so I thank you guys for all your prayers. And like Brother Valentine said, we have so much more to talk about. Um, but I just want to say thank you guys. And that God moved through us because of your prayers and because of who he is. And don't ever forget that, that your prayers count. I know now in today's world, you know, when there's bad things that happen, people say, you know, thoughts and prayers. And there's a lot of people that say, well, I don't want your thoughts and prayers because it doesn't help. It helps, church. I'm telling you, it helps. So continue to pray and seek out God. Pray for others. Pray for each other. And God will continue to move through this little church. We touched three countries because we were in Malawi, Uganda, and Kenya through our small little church. So thank you, guys. Amen. Going to close now. And uh, 
just uh, as you can well see, God made an impact in these men's lives. He did it in the countries. We walked in there and they were so overwhelmed and they so rejoiced that we had went. You know why we went? Because of you. Pastor Tony Moreno and I, we initiated the first move last year and we made this move this year. Next year, I believe that uh, we're going to have another team going in the following year. So we're planning on uh, more impact in more lives. And you don't have to go to this church to be a part of what we're doing because God wants to use everyone. But if you go to this church and you're a part, your giving has established these things. Your giving has helped build homes. Your giving has brought rice and beans to the people that don't have food. Your giving has opened multiple doors because we send your money to these areas to help these people. So you have a part. As we close this morning, I just want you to be encouraged that what you've done in your life, the thing that you sometimes think is little, you drop $5 into the offering, $100, $1,000, you're making an impact. So as long as you make the effort, God is going to make the way. And he's broken the back of the enemy. We went in there and we broke demons. We broke lives. We broke hearts, and God just moved. They uh, received us like uh, we were prophets, and uh, that's what they operated in, that honorable action, and God just uh, did a wonderful thing, and I just want to say happy birthday to my granddaughter, Gabriella. Gabriella, why don't you stand? Stand up, sweetheart. This is my granddaughter. And she's going to high school this year. I love you, baby. So let's close. I'm not going to uh, open an altar this morning. But what I am going to do is encourage you to come. Uh, next week, uh, God has told me uh, that uh, I'm going to minister on the yoke and anointing. So we're going to break yoke. Amen. And we're going to open the anointing. Let the anointing pour. And what I told these men, and just as Pastor Tony and I had went as well, I said, God is going to spread his anointing upon you, and your level of ministry is going to raise to such a, a point in place that you'll never be the same again. Thank you. We love you. And we're still pumped about it. We've not lost it. Even Pastor Tony has that in him. And I believe him and Marguerite are going next year. So uh, we're kicking the devil between the, in the teeth and between the chest. Amen? I'm not going to say any more, but I'm going to bless you and ask God to just let us go home and enjoy the rest of the day. Amen? Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you. Why don't you stand as I pray and close? Lord, we thank you for what you've done. We thank you for all the changes that have taken place. We thank you how you have broken down the enemy's territory and the gates of hell shall not, shall not prevail against the church. For we are the children of God. And we serve the anointed one, the master, the Lord, King Jesus Christ. Father, bless your children and bless the house in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's children shouted, Amen. Amen. Why don't you turn and love somebody?